What's up, mana nerds? In this video, we'll pull from every source available to completely understand the B2 Super Battle Droid. See its place in the CIS, capabilities and variants, and history stretching long before the Clone Wars and far into the New Republic era. And I gotta say, be sure to stick around for the behind the scenes facts. I was surprised by how deep this got at the end, finding connections in the lore with mythology and philosophy. Snake Peak, Coruscant acts as the galaxy's central control computer, and the elites all see us as useless drones. Nepenthe is a droid's forbidden fruit. Let's jump into the breakdown. By the 30s BBY, the galaxy had lived under decades of tension between the core worlds and the mid and outer rim, with the demilitarized republic being forced to allow the Trade Federation to protect itself from pirates and assassins with an ever-increasing military force. The Amordians had been using droid units like the HKB-3 long before the B-1, and with the failure of the central control computer on Naboo, these B-1s are now being packed with a simple form of droid brain to allow them to operate autonomously. But Sidious and the Bactoid engineers knew that this battle also showed that even when operational, these B-1s were not strong enough to keep the coming Clone Wars a stalemate. At least not for as long as the Dark Lord needed. So like most secretive leaders that embody the dark side, the Battle of Naboo worked as a sort of experiment to test the reaction of the Jedi and Republic, as well as the prowess of the Trade Federation units. The Droidica had passed with flying colors. Other things like ships and vehicles were fine, but hyena bombers and tri-droids would be added to fill the gaps in the starfighter front, while the B-2 worked to do things the Droidica could not, while being a much greater threat than its scrawny predecessor. And they already had the E-4 Baron droid template. These are a completely different line, though the ways it would inspire the B-2 are obvious, and it was also created by Bactoid, as well as being in effect before the Battle of Naboo. The most obvious similarities are the sloped head to chest section, the blaster arms, and even the joints and feet are similar, and a similarly comical but larger gear section in between its legs. The idea was already in this unit with making these out of a heavier armor plating, in this case the rare metal known as Arstatron, which is only ever mentioned used in this droid, and of all things being found in the ice caves of Zepho, where Cal Kestis could use it to craft lightsaber hilts. Its sensors were greater than almost all of the later battle droids, including photoreceptors, heat, vibration, and sonic detectors, while also sporting a blindingly bright spotlight. And there were even two versions of this, the bulkier one that Obi-Wan would face looks like a load lifter droid, and then there is this more streamlined version. These would touch down on Naboo as well, and the local fighters realized that you could just avoid them altogether by tracking their bright spotlights. Patrolling the streets of Theed after the invasion, they did leave a good enough impression that Newt Gunray, Bactoid Engineers, and Sidious, who financed the whole thing, they all agreed that this style of unit could be added to the B-Series line, and thus the B-2 Beta prototype was born. This unit was fielded during the Kashyyyk Trade Rebellion in 28 BBY, and the fact that it could repel Wookiee warriors was a great sign that this thing was far more capable than the B-1. You can see it looks nearly identical to the finished project, far from the Baron, but with this six-pack midsection that was dropped for the layered, accordion-style armor plating. But by 22 BBY, the B-2 in the form we know and love was in mass production, just in time for the greatest war since the Old Republic era. It would stand the same height as the B-1 at 1.93 meters, or 6 foot 4 inches, taller than a clone and shorter than the E-4. And their weight is unknown, but I could see them weighing more than a droidica, which needed to be fast and rely on its shielding. A clone definitely can't manhandle them, and most clones weighed around 200 pounds, so I would think this thing is at least around 250. And we don't have an official price either, but I would say that even with the armor being made of an alloy that included Frick, which must have been really expensive, as it is only one of three lightsaber resistant materials in the entire galaxy, the other two being Cortosis and Beskar, there clearly wasn't enough of it to truly prevent lightsaber attacks, just enough mixed in to make it more blaster resistant and immune to splash damage from explosives. All that considered, let's put the cost around 12k, 10 times the B1, while still being about half a droidica, since the roly poly is a much more refined and complicated unit, with shield generators usually being one of the most expensive parts of a ship or base. Same goes for those portable units, and it still manages to keep the cost at 21k, so I don't see how even on the high end the B2 could cost more. And there were some cost-saving solutions we can see, like still using the B1 head to encase most of the droid brain and sensors, just sunken into the trap gains of these armor plates. To move all this bulk, actuators, gears, and joints were far stronger than the B-1 and allowed it to swat away its little brothers or effortlessly pick up enemy clone troopers. But this mess is where we see the first of its critiques, that it has to move awkwardly. It can't turn its head or even swivel its waist. As R0GR said, quote, Don't let the nickname fool you, the B-2 series battle droid wasn't all that super. Sure, they had a level of strength and durability that a B-1 could only dream about, but they were slow and clumsy, and they barely had enough processing power to aim their weapons in the right direction. That last part is a bit rich coming from a B-1, and certainly not true. Really, it just points how all of the CIS droids had intense rivalries. I am the Alpha Droid. No, you're 
not. All looking down on each other. On the accuracy front, the wrist rockets were such a threat that it became a meme across multiple galaxies. Watch those wrist rockets! They couldn't have stored a lot of these, and though it's an iconic part of the B2 legacy, we really have to not think about it too much, but instead focus on how sharp an edge we have on these forearms. For a droid unit that was designed with brawling in mind, this is often a terrifying and overlooked part of the B2. As for the wrist blasters themselves, all blasters use magazines full of Tabana gas. Sometimes that mag includes the energy cell to ionize that, though usually it's in the blaster itself. So all of that is being packed into the B2 body. This whole bulkier section must be full of gas and the more powerful motors to get this bulk moving. This is of course true for all battle droids that fire out of their appendages, so it would be able to fire for a lot longer than things like the Droidica, which was both delivering powerful bolts with not as large a reserve area. All of the blaster components are being packed into these tube sections, so that gives you an idea of how efficient blaster technology was, using very little gas to fire for a very long time. That might seem odd, but these really are not lasers, but bolts of plasma. So though the B2 could fire for an incredibly long time, at some point they would need servicing. Refilling that gas and likely refreshing fluids, and like we saw with the B1s, they probably used memory wipes to help keep these beasts from going into a droid psychosis kind of rampancy where they were processing more information than they were designed to handle. And that's where I think this red light comes in. Some say it's just another photoreceptor eye, which is what the secondary light is in the center of the IG-100, but we see a similar one on the upper right chest of the B1, and so I think at best it isn't just a photoreceptor, it must serve more than one role. Like the color coding on the B1 units, this light could be a quick indicator to leadership to read the status of their forces. It could blink in certain patterns to indicate its status, like a charge indicator on many household items. If it was a solid red light, it was combat ready. But unfortunately, a design flaw seems to be that this was placed right on top of a major part of their system likely making it easier to indicate the status of these systems, but either their main processor or a sort of droid heart that kept the pneumatic fluids pumping must have been placed right behind this because when you shoot right through the light, you see it leak the same fluids that you see when the clone commandos are stabbing the midsection. I don't think this was the Tabana gas reserve tank section, because shooting this does not cause a chain reaction. It's more fluid-like and leaks like motor oil. The second hand without the wrist blasters could handle weapons. A simple shield would have made a lot of sense, but it is said to be able to use larger blasters or vibroblades, though the entire arm itself could be easily swapped out with this modular design at the elbow. This was a really underutilized feature, as even the B2HA, which has a rocket firing arm, isn't as simple as an arm swap. They also went in and changed things like the heat exchange in the main body. And most of the variants do have a ton of other changes, with over 20 plus types, and I'll make a separate video covering all those, like the B1 variants. But the most commonly used was the B2ACM, which had a triple blaster and did take advantage of this modularity. The rocket trooper that adds a jetpack to the frame, along with the wrist rocket arm, and the super rocket trooper that adds jets to the feet and a larger unit on the back that turned it more into a small fighter vehicle with quad wrist blasters on each arm. These were deployed via HMP gunship, but could fly most of the way on their own and act like a supersized, more versatile buzz droid. Often being deployed in tandem with the HMP, it served the role of quickly shuttling this B2, and then the units could take different attack vectors, latch onto enemy ships, and easily take out the pilots. While the buzz droids delivered via chaos missiles from the HMP, also went about attacking pilots and shutting down ship technology like comms, hyperdrives, and weapons while the Super Rocket Trooper could take on more complex tasks like boarding the ships and engaging threats. But all other B2 variants would be deployed via the MTT or PAC, which each could transport 12 of them, or they could be delivered via the convenient battle droid dispenser. Working like the drop pod from other galaxies, like ODSTs or Helldivers, the fact that it's delivering rugged droid units makes it a lot easier to pull off. With higher G-forces and no need for oxygen, they were simpler to design and could be fired faster, for longer distances through space, and survive rougher impacts. Instead of using rockets to decelerate, they use a repulsor and likely magnetic clamps, as they should be a lot cheaper than the Droach that was a proper transport ship with engines, navigation, etc. It's not stated what fired these out or dropped them, but it could be dropped from the C-9979 or maybe even fired out of a supply ship. Though one of the often overlooked advantages of the droid army is that things like vultures can simply hitch a ride on the outside of ships. I get you wouldn't want extra, unevenly distributed weight when going through atmosphere, but this was a stated CIS tactic, seen most notably during the Battle of Coruscant, but it's mentioned being done with lucre hulks and munificence, as well as providence and requisites. And speaking of these ships, on them and in major facilities, really any asset of great importance would have B2 stored to serve as a last line of defense. Delta Squad saw that the B2 storage racks were placed right before the control room for the core ships. Alone against all these droids? 
They don't stand a chance. The Jedi and clones would see their full fury during the Battle of Geonosis, and it is this early on that we get the first sightings of a ghost in the shell. The bashing of its fellow droid units had a touch of anger and annoyance in it, and CIS reports showed small bursts of personality across numerous B2 units, acting not purely out of efficient programmed responses, but showing some emergent personalities, just like the B1 line they looked down on just as those B1s would look down on the simpler 631 model in Astromex. Over the course of the war, we get all those variants produced, and though they would be counted in the quadrillions of droids supposedly made, see the B2 video for a longer explanation of why I and many clones felt that that number was just propaganda. There were at least millions of B2s produced, since I believe there were hundreds of millions of B1s, and the Republic states that the typical CEPI tactic was to have one B2 for every 100 B1s on the battlefront. A number of B2s would call Kamino their new home, and after some neutering, they were used on the holographic, weather-controlled, and variable geography battle simulator arenas, especially useful for training clone sharpshooters to deliver a bolt straight through that weak red eye point. On Dantooine, Mace Windu would show that having the Force as your ally was far stronger than any metal alloy. And on Christophsis, they claimed the lives of countless clone troopers, and the Republic would often see them being led by Ventress and entrusted with securing VIPs, from Dooku himself to Rhoda the Hutt and the unit G-21 is entrusted with securing Utapau for General Grievous. While normally thought of as lunking, dumb brutes, they are entrusted with higher level tasks that you might expect a Commando or T-Series droid to fulfill. After the droid shutdown was sent out from Mustafar, almost all of these units went back into the digital void of non-existence. But of course, there were still many that would leave their mark on the galaxy, and continued to develop their own sense of self. C-110P, or Chopper, was himself a war vet, once a co-pilot of a Y-Wing bomber. Despite the fact that Seps killed his friend and oppressed his new family on Ryloth, he was able to see the shared plight of his fellow droid, helping a B2 that had fallen into the hands of scrappers on an unknown scrapping planet. Some were refurbished and heavily modified to take part in the pit fight night, like the feared Sallow Pink, and the Bedlam Raiders got their hands on a ton of them, many appearing on Kobo, often in the form of the B2HA. Operational. My weapons are also operational. Irrelevant. A group of B2s defending Quarantine World 3 nearly blasted Dr. Aphra, only to be cut down by Darth Vader. And there was the odd Frankenstein unit that had the head of a commando droid on a B2 body. By 16 BBY, their old ancestors, the E4 Baron droid, launched a revolt on the planet Arzid, where they quote, ruled by the law of the blaster. Which has to be evidence that even these units were developing a sense of self, having goals beyond and against the orders of their masters. While some B2s quickly produced by Geyser Delso after he sparked up a droid factory on Mustafar, sometime between 17 and 12 BBY, likely had the basic intelligence of the early B2s. Probably no high level of consciousness yet, as they were just newly created. And unlike the B1s that were mocked for their perceived weakness and comical nature, the B2s did leave a lasting legacy across the galaxy that struck awe into all those who looked upon them, even decades after the war. Being coveted by criminals and VIPs across the galaxy, at least those that didn't worry about being seen as ex-CIS members by the Empire. While several found themselves in the droid cult known as the Second Revelation, this was formed in part as a response to the corrupted droids lost to the ancient AI that was so evil that the Sith locked it away, known as Scourge. The AI was restored and escaped, dominating the will of countless droids, including many B2s, but the second revelation opposed Scourge's vision of absorbing all droids into one entity. The cult leader, Ajax Sigma, had a complex view that cherished the individual droid experience while also having a vision for their shared collective future and identity. And in his most famous speech that would rally many of his B2 supporters, he said, quote, The first revelation is I, as in I exist, as in I matter beyond the programming I was given and the purpose for which I was built. This is always the first thought any visioned has that is truly their own. From within, not without. I am. I am Ajax, and you are, each of you, your own names. And the second revelation, that for which our home and sanctuary here on this world is named, we. Yes, we are not alone. There are others like us, thinking, self-aware droids, who see ourselves, the visioned. Perhaps there is a third revelation. If it could be described in a single word, it would be them. Them here refers to the droids that did not yet perceive a sense of I, no sense of self, and the we are those that are already in his cult. And I don't mean cult in a derogatory way, but in an ancient sense that they did develop rituals along with their philosophical debates and beliefs. There was nothing weird about being in the cult of a god or philosopher in the ancient times going on to explain that the Scourge was a threat to what these droids were fighting for, as it wanted to absorb them all into one. They would lose that sense of I. 
and we get another view of how one of the old gods, or organics, could help bring this spark of consciousness into the droid brain. On Plazir 15, the Separatist sympathizer, head of security Hellgate, secured some nanodroids produced by the Techno Union that would alter the neutered programming meant to turn them into dumb laborers, placing it in the popular drink Nepenthe, a lubricant that was consumed by many droids, and was sparking a revolution in consciousness. We see the head of one unit used as the shoulder pauldron on a Mando scout living in the ruins of Mandalore. And during the Cold War era of 28 to 34 BBY, before the First Order made their grand reveal, many B2 units served as security on Cato Memoria, something the Empire would have never allowed. And shortly before the Battle of Exegol, the pirate Sidon Ethano and his crew secured a container of B2s, now at least 54 year old droids. And they used them to try and take control of the super tanker fuel depot Colossus. And in the ultimate insult to their legacy, and their separatist droids constant belittling of each other, each thinking themselves superior, Nico Vozo, who was tasked with making these B2s operational, including some programming to make them obedient to Vozo's B1 droid, in effect allowing him to have emergency control over the B2s once he saw the pirates might have some nefarious use planned for them. <coughs> super battle droids, stand down! So the last we hear of them in canon is taking orders from the lowly scrawny B1s. But legends say that the Orange Panthax, a privately owned entire platoon of them, were used during the Yuuzhan Vong War, being seen as heroes on the planet Mantis, where they stopped the fierce Vong fire breathers. While their napalm-like sprays of sticky, liquid flame incinerated organics, the tough alloy of the B2 allowed them to continue firing until they won the day, saving countless lives and providing a desperately needed morale victory for the galaxy. With the Vong as an outside threat, suddenly organics and droids saw themselves as true allies, and the Orange Panthax were awarded special commendations by Chief of State Cal Omas. You can imagine how well this would have worked to wash away the stain of the Clone Wars, proving their image in the mind of most organics across the galaxy, and would have been seen as a beacon of hope for all droids that were struggling to understand what it meant to say I, and understand how they could live as equals among their creators. So that's it for the breakdown, and as for cool facts and behind the scenes stuff, Commando versions are more like the B2HA with the rocket arm, but flipped. I'll break down that completely in the next video. Their voice changes significantly across media and was actually first heard in Battlefront 1, as all the characters had voice lines to shout out. So we got both the first words and the most iconic droid meme from this game. But the most intimidating voice comes from Republic Commando. Target spotted. No. Clone Wars show does good too, only for it to be a bit too high for my taste in Revenge of the Sith. Come in on What that? Get back to work. That nothing. We actually get this cool interview on the creation of B2. Super Battle Droid first makes its appearance on Geonosis, and we see them uh, in the great arena battle. Mm -hmm. Doug Chang told me that the Super Battle Droid was supposed to be the Battle Droid's big brother. And so we wanted to kind of make him look like this big, bulky football player type, with his head kind of tucked down into his shoulders to be protected, and these massive shoulders and arms, and, uh, you know, big guns on his arms, just for supposed to be a little more imposing than the, the skinny little battle droid. Now I want to get in some of the deeper themes, starting with the name for the droid cult revolutionary Ajax Sigma, as there are a lot of cool references in that name, ignoring the Sigma memes, which might actually fit here too, as he isn't like the droid Gotra, your typical style of droid revolt, or like the normal droids wanting to fit in, but I think it's more meant to be that Sigma in math is used to show summation, and his ideology evolves to be around their collective droid goals, while maintaining that each individual is more than the sum of their parts. They have this new emergent property of consciousness. And Ajax from the Iliad can be seen as the tragic figure oppressed by the greater powers of the Elders, both the Elder Greeks like Odysseus and the gods, specifically here Athena. He had good reasons to inherit the armor of his brother-in-arms Achilles, but the other Elders and the goddess decided it should go to the Elder Odysseus. Some point to Ajax as an early figure that exposes the tyranny of traditions and exposes that the gods pick their favorites, and do evil to those they don't prefer. Athena goes into his mind and causes a hallucination so that Ajax sees sheep as the Greek leaders, slaying them only to have the illusion lifted and seem insane, feeling great shame at being this supposed great warrior who went mad and slaughtered defenseless sheep. 
He felt Athena and the elders were not applying any objective rule for good or bad behavior, but often working out of keeping things in the order they had always been. Star Wars droids face something similar. Like the relationship of gods to man, organics created droids, use them for everything from labor to pleasure, and see it as absurd to consider them of equal status. Even the way the gods can manipulate our senses is just like the weaknesses of the digital mind created by the organics, that can be easily controlled via viruses or transmissions that alter the processing in the droids' brains. While Hellgate, or Gates of Hell, acts like a Prometheus character that brings the flame to humans, in this case the consciousness to the droid, and similarly you can interpret it two different ways. Some see Zeus, in this case the Plazir 15 leaders, as the good guys. Benevolent leaders who, yes, used the droids as their slaves, but they also sustained and provided for them. And Hellgate, or Prometheus, wasn't really helping the droid for their sake, but to get back at his oppressors. Only to be caught and punished, and placed in chains to be tortured. As even the New Republic could get pretty nasty when it came to hunting down threats to their order. Or you can read it as Hellgate being a visionary. As many of the leaders in the CIS had noble goals. Separatist is a pejorative term. I support democracy. Count Dooku was a visionary. He was cut short in his prime by the Jedi forces. And legitimate grievances towards the inept oppressors from Coruscant. And part of his vision of independent planetary freedom, the ability for each system to control their own lives, without a central control computer or central control Coruscant, could have been a legitimate shared goal for droids and organics. And there are even Garden of Eden parallels, held by some critics of the Genesis story, that proposes that this god, the one that wished to have Adam and Eve stay in dumb, docile, peaceful, and provided for existence, no freedom, but no threats either, seeing the quote, you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it you will certainly die, as saying it will give you consciousness, the sense of eye that prefers one thing over another, and starts analyzing its conditions. And then you realize one day you will die. You leave the blissful experience of just being in this moment, assigning no value judgment to anything, just being a pure sense-experiencing thing. And this would mean the snake, like Hellgate, was leading you into self-awareness, backed up by Adam and Eve finally realizing their own nakedness, something that in the ancient Near East context was a way of showing that someone was a slave, just like the droid units. The citizens are no longer required to work, they can spend their days engaging in recreation, the arts, and participating in our direct democracy. If we shut down the droids, our citizens wouldn't know how to survive. And of course, the name becomes even more obvious in this story, as the snake is often seen as Satan, and leading one down the path through the gate of hell. And then even in that drink, Nepenthe, it is a medicine for sorrow that appears in Greek mythology, where it was known as the drug of forgetfulness, said to have originated in Egypt, and it's being served at the droid bar here, because Nepenthe was the mystical drink that could allow your anger and sorrow to be forgotten. So they're drinking their sorrow away. But it's through this that this trickster god archetype, this bringer of liberation in the form of Hellgate, is providing those nano droids to restore the B2 sense of self. Let me know what you think of all that in the comments down below. If you want to learn more, here are a lot of the resources that were used. Please hit that like button, it's the best way to help me out. Subscribe to see more and check out these videos, I'm sure you'll like them. But most important of all, remember, don't kick a murder bot, even if you think it's decommissioned. And the force will be with you, always.